So we know that mobile games are bad, right? But I had no idea just how poisonous some of them are. And that's because I've been secretly talking with developers from big companies and I was told exactly how these games exploit the player's psychology to get them to spend money. And I promise, you will be surprised to find out who popularized some of these predatory tactics. So let's talk about what makes mobile games so toxic. This video will be a constant spiral of oh it gets worse. For example, you know those mobile ads you see everywhere? Well, it turns out the games they advertise don't actually exist. Get this, it's apparently a common practice for companies to A-B test ads for fake vaporware games and whichever ad gets more attention, they start making that game. For the longest time I've stayed away from mobile games because I had this gut feeling that they are not made to be inherently good games games, but instead their design is driven by profits. It turns out, most mobile games are filled with unethical ways of getting players to spend money, and for the past few weeks I've been talking with developers from some big companies and I was told how the morally questionable sausage is made. Now, for obvious reasons, those developers will remain anonymous, but you know who you are and I thank you for exposing these secrets I'm going to talk about. And also, the games shown on screen are not necessarily related to the topics I discuss. So in the hopes of making players aware of these tricks and help you avoid them as well, I'm going to shine a light on these predatory schemes and the companies behind them. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, the well-known role-playing game focused on epic PvP battles. And let me tell you about the Doom Tower, which is basically a giant prison full of evil monsters that is slowly failing. So now it's up to us to go in there and knock some heads before they get out. You're going to need some seriously powerful champions with high resistance to remove debuffs since the Doom Tower bosses ignore block debuffs. I personally love the PvP arena battles and how addictive the game is as you slay monsters. And because you're watching this video, you can start off on the right foot by getting Raid Shadow Legends right now and if you use the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. Like for example, the free epic champion Rector Drath alongside 20,000 silver, 1 energy refill and 1 XP boost. And on top of all of that, you'll also get 1 Ancient Shard so you can summon awesome champions as soon as you start playing. All of these treasures will be waiting for you right here, but act fast because all of these will only be available for the next 30 days and only for new players and you don't want to miss out on these. So check the link in the description or scan the QR code and get Raid Shadow Legends right now. <coughs> Sorry about that. So normally I try to cover topics in a fairly objective way, but this video will be a bit more personal as I have some strong feelings about this topic. I grew up with PC games and naturally I started developing PC games as well and even though they were the standard, I always hated microtransactions with a passion. To the point where there's a clear anti-microtransactions message in my own game, Move or Die, I also made sure that there is no way to spend real world money to buy anything from my game. That's the I'm doing my part section of this video. It probably doesn't make a difference in the grand scheme of things, but eh, what the hell. I guess I missed the days when games were good. Back when you saw someone rocking sweet gear, you knew that meant that they were a force to reckon with. They either spent a lot of time grinding for it or they took down an epic boss. It was a symbol of skill. Nowadays you have to buy nail polish in order to unlock a specific color armor. So when you see someone with a fancy skin, it just means they have a lot of money. 2, I only have 2,250, oh well, okay. Uh, I'm probably gonna spend more money. Okay, there's crack shot. Um. The industry got greedy and things got bad. We went from horse armor and microtransactions in fully priced single player games to literally not being able to afford playing a free to play game. Try wrapping your head around that sentence. I'm on team PC and it's sad to see these trends seep into PC games as well, but it's so much worse in the mobile world. If you take all the money generated by all PC games and you add on top of that all revenue generated 
powered by consoles, that is Nintendo, Sony and Microsoft combined, they make less money than the mobile game industry. And they got there by making ethical design choices and being honest with their players, is probably what they tell their employees. Look, there's this popular talk on how to get your mobile players to spend money and it's called Let's Go Whaling. And if you thought that the title was in poor taste, just let me show you how the talk actually starts. Some of you will probably uh, be slightly shocked by all the tricks I have listed here, but I'll leave the morality of it out of the talk. We can discuss it uh, if we have time later he did not talk about it later. So, mobile games got so big by being deceiving on purpose and using predatory tactics in games that are designed to be very approachable like free-to-play and hyper-casual games. These are specifically aimed at players that are unaware of those predatory tactics and the companies behind those games abuse psychological tricks to separate those players from their wallets. It turns out a lot of those players are retired senior citizens or people with gambling addictions that are already in debt, spending money that they don't really have, and boy are those games good at squeezing money out of those players. And I know, you're thinking, it's fine, I don't fall for those tricks and I've never spent any money in a mobile game before. And I thought the same thing, but it turns out even if you don't spend money in those games, you're still contributing to the predatory system without even realizing it. But in order to explain that, I'll have to tell you about what's going on inside the companies responsible for those games. So remember those ads that decide which game gets to be made? Well, it turns out that profit-based mentality is seen throughout the development process of the most successful mobile games. Basically, you do what's most profitable, and design decisions are actively motivated by maximizing profits. I was told by one of the developers that a lot of players requested the ability to reset their skills. However, they voted against it internally simply because it made no difference on the game profits. This mentality is also present in the actual composition of the development teams, where in PC and console game dev teams for example, the focus is on actual development, so a majority of team members work in creative disciplines like art, programming, writing and design. While on the other hand, in the mobile world, development teams lean way more on live ops, community managers and overall disciplines that relate to user acquisition rather than creative work. There are also psychologists contractors and data scientists present in teams in order to interpret player behavior and drive the design choices based on numbers and statistics. Two handed five star. Yeah! The guy from the previous talk mentions that there are four types of game progression, skill, luck, grind and pay, and I quote, make sure that your games aren't too skill based. I made that mistake myself, you don't get people to pay you because there's no reason to. So the most popular mobile games out there focus on the grinding and paying types of progression design. Internally, companies call this pay to compete and it's deeply integrated within the gameplay itself. There's this concept in game design called a gameplay loop, which is in broad strokes what you do in a game. For example, a gameplay loop can be focused on explore, combat and upgrade. Some gameplay loops are really short and some of them can get pretty big, but if you want to make a profitable mobile game the in-game store must be a core part of the gameplay loop. That's how you end up with the so-called whale players spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in those games. Oh, and I was told that internally the term whale is kind of frowned upon, and instead more sensible alternatives are used like big spender or VIP. And you've probably heard about the concept of whales in mobile games before and you didn't think much of it because obviously you're not one of those whale players, you're better, you don't spend money in those games. But have you ever heard about the saying that you either pay for a product or you are the product? Here's the thing, as a free player, you are the content for those whales. 
Games are designed to monetize bullying, constantly pushing for that power trip and forcing players to attack each other, only to encourage them to spend even more money in-game, be it to gear up for a fight or damage control after one. Oh, and if it wasn't bad enough, I was told that it is standard practice in the industry to give preferential treatment to those VIP players. For example, a lot of companies have a zero tolerance policy, so if a player harasses someone else in the in-game chat, they get insta-banned. However, I heard many anecdotes about support tickets from VIP players being prioritized and whenever they broke the rules, which sometimes involved death threats towards other players, they simply got off with a slap on the wrist because banning them would be a direct hit to the company's profits. But how players end up spending so much money is a more involved journey with a bunch of dirty tricks, so let me tell you how these games exploit your attention. The initial purpose of a mobile game is to hook you, to get your attention and to keep it for long enough that playing the game becomes a habit, with the end goal of it turning into a hobby. Naturally, every sane player goes in with the mentality of I will never pay for a mobile game. And that is very good. It's also the exact mentality that designers are trying to break. And the secret to doing that is keeping players playing for as long as possible. Engagement is sometimes valued above monetization because everyone breaks eventually. So games employ sneaky little tricks to take advantage of your curiosity. For example, if you haven't opened the game for a few hours, you'll get a notification that says, congratulations, you got a gift. Now, the secret sauce is strategically withholding information. Notice how it simply says a gift without mentioning what it is actually, and that is done on purpose. There's this theory that we have two types of thinking. A system one, also known as fast thinking, which is automatic, like recognizing objects and making fast decisions based on intuition. And a system two, also known as slow thinking. This is where rationality comes into play, where your brain needs time to analyze something and make a calculated decision. Now, can you guess which one? It's system one. Mobile games are all about the fast thinking system and are focused on immediate gratification without making the players think too much because we don't want any rationality when it comes to financial decisions, right? If they're not gonna give me book of books, then I'm gonna buy my own book of cards. So I have all the book of books. And similarly to exploiting your attention, these games also exploit their own content. Spending time to craft new content for an update that delivers a memorable experience would be the right thing to do. But making content is expensive. It takes time and money, so companies find creative workarounds. If you thought that different colored enemies was lazy, let me introduce you to mobile game content. Levels, items, and skins are basically on a loop, being recycled every 12 weeks throughout various timed seasonal events. And pretty much every month more powerful items are added to the game without worrying too much about power creep. After all, an overpowered item is more exciting to pay for than one that's properly balanced. And when a piece of content like a skin performs really well, it is analyzed to death in the hopes of replicating its success and milk it as much as possible. The name of the game is making sure that players can spend at least $1000 on in-app purchases. And even that is considered considered to be the bare minimum in the industry, with some games aiming for no spending limits by designing the game in such a way that there is no definitive end. You're encouraged to keep spending money on consumables like potions and timed boosts until you burn out. And the sad thing is that these tricks go beyond just abusing your curiosity and attention, so when it comes to convincing you to start spending money, this is how they get you. You already know about loot boxes, since they have been all over games for the past few years. They have a good presence in mobile games, but they have also been used in PC and console games for a while now. Can you guess who popularized the whole loot box mechanic? Valve. 
of all companies in a 2010 patch for Team Fortress 2 where the crate and key system was introduced. There were even international debates on loot boxes and their gambling routes and as a result legislation was created forcing developers to make the item drop percentage odds public. I was told that initially complying with this legislation caused a little bit of worry internally but companies realized shortly after that there was no noticeable change in players spending habits even with the odds being public. Uh, guns at... Oh! Oh! <laughs> Stat -trick! Going even further, games will be designed to constantly expose you to the idea of getting rare items. So whenever a friend or a party member from your guild receives a rare item, a message will be broadcasted showing up on your screen letting you know that someone close to you got lucky. This in turn reinforces the idea that you too could get lucky and throughout overexposure convince you to spend money for that one lucky roll. And the chance of getting a legendary item tends to be very, very small. We're talking somewhere in the ballpark of like 0.001%. These are called chase items and they keep players chasing them and constantly spend money while only being rewarded with common low tier items. However, psychology studies reveal that players will only put up with that for so long, so games have built in systems to estimate when you're about to give up. They know how many loot boxes you've opened and exactly what items you've got and if you do that repeatedly, after a certain number of common items, the game will intentionally reward you with with a slightly rarer item in order to keep your hopes up and keep you spending. Oh yes, 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 that's a good one. Desert Eagle print stream. Oh, minimal wear with good flow. That's very nice. Wait, how much is this one? I think it's like 80 euro or something. Now, when it comes to actually spending money, most games have different custom in-game currencies. Gems, coins, crystals, whatever thematic fitting currency with the purpose of creating a disconnection between the number on your screen and your real world money. The whole idea is to make players feel like they're not really spending money. And these custom currencies can only be purchased in a predetermined amounts which are very specifically fine-tuned to ensure that after you're done shopping, you will always have a little bit of leftover currency. So let's say you want this fortune chest that costs 750 gems. Of course, there is no option to purchase exactly 750 gems, so the closest to that amount is this bundle of 1200 gems. Alright, you take your wallet out and with those gems you buy your chest. You now have 450 gems to spare. Sweet! You get an emote and now you're left with 200 gems. There is nothing in this store you can buy for 200 gems. You only need 50 more to get something. But what's that? The smallest amount of gems you can buy is 80. This is very intentional and you'll always found yourself in a position where you're just shy of being able to afford something from the in-game store. And if you're resistant to purchasing something in the first place, oh boy they have a solution for that as well. You know how when there is a discount on a game you can tell your friend to get that game because it is common knowledge that these discounts are the same for everyone? Well, not in mobile games. If you are a free player who has yet to spend any money in the game, you will get custom discounts tailored for you in order to persuade you to open up your wallet. These discounts are presented as limited time offers that get cheaper and cheaper over time. Doesn't matter how low they have to go, even if it's a few cents, because as soon as you start spending money, they have you going down that slippery slope. A live op dev told me that they have a huge amount of fine controls to personalize these player based discounts to show up exactly in the moments of time when players are more likely to start spending. Be it when they finish the tutorial or if their account is older than a week or if they just won a PvP match and they're in a good mood. There are even services out there with specifically trained AI models designed to automatically serve up these discounts to players at the most profitable moment in time. And the worrying thing about all of this is that they wrap these psychological tricks in the context of social interactions.
first of all, most of the predatory tactics I've mentioned so far take advantage of players' fear of missing out. We are social creatures and naturally we want to be part of things and feel like we belong. And that is a reoccurring weakness that these games abuse constantly. All of these discounts are on a limited timer on purpose. They tell you to act now because the offer will expire soon and you definitely don't want to miss out on this one. We see this in our everyday lives, including PC and console games where the currently most popular form of this exploit was born. The Battle Pass. A linear timeline of items that you gradually unlock as you play the game. Now, can you tell me who was the first developer to popularize Valve? It was Valve again with Dota 2 in 2013. The thing is, that fear of missing out concept is amplified even further by sprinkling some free unlocks on that battle pass timeline while keeping all the good stuff locked behind a paywall. This way, as you play the game and level up, you will see your progress go up the battle pass and you'll get a few freebies. But now, the game has the power to tell you, look at all these awesome premium items you can unlock right now if you pay just $9 for the battle pass. You worked so hard to level up to this point, it would be a shame if the battle pass season passes and you miss out on all of these awesome premium items. You've already put in the work, what is 9 more dollars, right? 9 more dollars disguised in our in-game currency that will leave you with leftovers, but let's not mention that. So this is known as loss aversion, and it's the concept of giving the players something and threaten them that you'll take it away if they don't pay. This works because people get attached to the idea of owning something, so they're more likely to pay to prevent the loss of ownership than they would be to gain something to begin with. Some games will show you premium currency you gain in your bank by simply playing the game, but in order to gain access to that bank and be able to use it, you guessed it, you gotta pay. Other games reward you with loyalty points the more you spend, but in order to maintain those points, you must spend a minimum amount each month. Same toxic trick, but in a different packaging. Lots of... I can see why this, why this is rewarding, when I just click things and it looks really cool, and I go and get stuff, so like, alright, cool. And the final nail in the coffin is that all of this is leveraging the power of social interactions. As I mentioned before, we're social creatures, and the companies behind these games are well aware of that. So minutes within starting a new game, you'll be asked to join a guild. Here's a list of guilds looking for members, team up with other players, or invite over some friends to play with. There is a big focus on putting social pressure on players and get them to form real friendships with other players because that's what's going to keep them playing and spending more. Social pressure is a great way to maintain engagement, and the horrible thing is that people actually make real friends in those games. I was told stories of real life players meetups or anecdotes of players getting married after they've met in game, but these relationships are forged in the context of a toxic platform. I was actually shocked when one of the developers I've talked to told me about a message they've got from one of the players asking them if they can lower the cost of a new feature because they simply can't afford to pay for it and their rent given that they were on a pension. We all know how difficult it is to move on to a new game when all of our friends are still playing the old one. So if you already have a gambling addiction and your social interactions with other friends happen throughout the in-game chat of a predatory game, you're simply stuck in an echo chamber where your bad tendencies are simply amplified. Especially when games also use the labeling technique, which is the idea that people are more likely to behave how they are told to. So if the game tells a player that they are generous and good at supporting the developers, they are presumably more likely to spend money in those games. By the way, thank you so much for already being subscribed to this channel. You have a great taste in game design YouTubers. I really appreciate it. So while these practices are not set in stone, it's a good idea to keep an eye out for them and be aware when you notice them in a game. 
It doesn't mean that a game is automatically out to get you if they use any of these practices. Hell, even I'm guilty of dipping into similar design decisions in the past. The question now is, what can we do as players to discourage these tactics and change the way this industry is? As I mentioned before, playing these games while not spending money is not good enough because you're the content for the paying players. So it's gonna sound super cheesy, but in this case, the best thing to do is to genuinely share this video with other people so they become aware of these tactics. And maybe the second best thing to do is to actually support those genuinely good mobile games out there that are not toxic. The games that were developed with the purpose of creating a memorable experience instead of squeezing your wallet dry. And those good games are not easy to find because they're not the big money makers. So let's change that. Let's fill up the comment section with examples of those games that deserve our attention. If you know one, drop it down below because I'll be there and I'll see you in the comments.